Today, we're taking a look at the Volti XP54, unofficially nicknamed the Swoosh Goose, which was an experimental fighter that was developed at the start of the 1940s. In 1939, the US Army Air Corps faced a bleak outlook. The most modern fighters in their inventory, the Seversky P-35 and the Curtis P-36, could barely break 300 miles an hour, comparing poorly with the German Messerschmitt Bf 109 or the British Supermarine Spitfire, which were both approximately 50 miles an hour faster. There were better American designs under development, such as the Curtis P-40 and the Lockheed P-38, but neither was in production, and designs submitted for the 1939 Pursuit Fighter competition showed little improvement was forthcoming. Seeking a solution, the Army, instead of hosting a traditional design competition in 1940, decided to obtain preliminary engineering data from 13 manufacturers. This was done through an informal request known as Data R40C. The goal of R40C was to encourage innovative designs through a series of wind tunnel tests in the hope of leapfrogging the European competition. The desired characteristics of these so-called innovative designs were outlined in Air Corps Specification XC622 in November of 1939. This outlined requirements for a single-engine, single-seat pursuit plane. It had to be armed with at least four machine guns, and the suggested engines included the 1250 horsepower Allison V1710, the 1700 horsepower Continental V1430, and the 1850 horsepower Pratt & Whitney H2600. The Army expected the designs would range from lightweight, conventional 425 mile an hour planes, powered by the V1710, to more unconventional 500 mile an hour models, potentially in the pusher configuration, powered by the H2600. They were mostly to be disappointed though, receiving 26 design proposals that only represented 8 unique concepts, and only some of those were acceptable. But of those few, some companies had played into the Army's hands with some truly unique designs. Of these designs, four would pass the initial evaluation reports, and thus progress onto the actual design and prototype phases. Interestingly, all four of these designs were for pusher-propeller aircraft, and these were submitted by Bell, Curtis Wright, Northrop, and Volte. At the beginning of 1940, the only fighter designed by Volte had been the unsuccessful Model 48 Vanguard, which had not received a production contract. Nevertheless, the Volte proposal was selected as the winner of the R40C competition, and a contract was awarded to produce two wind tunnel models, which would then progress to a full-scale mock-up, and then to a prototype providing each stage was successful. As far as designs went, Volte's Model 70 certainly met the Army's requirement for innovation, seeing as it featured many of them. Firstly, and most obviously, there was the design of the airframe itself. It was to be built as an inverted gullwing monoplane with a tail boom, with said tail flanking an 11-foot four-blade propeller. The center wing section was designed around a newly developed NACA ducted wing, where airflow was taken in via narrow slots in the leading edge, directed over the radiators and intercoolers, and then fed into the engine via ducts in the trailing edge. Housing the coolant radiators and intercoolers entirely within the wings was expected to provide a significant reduction in total drag and a corresponding increase in speed. The diameter of the propeller, along with the length of the fuselage and tail booms, necessitated a relatively tall landing gear, but this worked in the favour of another innovative design feature. The single-seat cockpit, located in the centre section of the fuselage, was to be pressurised. This was a very advanced feature for the time, and it would allow the pilot, and thus the aircraft, to perform more comfortably at higher altitudes. However, producing an effective seal for a pressurised cockpit was a challenge, even more so as traditional cockpit canopies opened outwards or slid backwards to allow access. This problem would be overcome in the Model 70 by having the pilot enter the cockpit from underneath. As the plane stood so high off the ground, climbing in under their own strength would be almost impossible for the pilot, and so a system was installed to electrically lower down the pilot seat for easier access. 
This was also to be used as a primitive ejection seat. With the propeller located behind the pilot, bailing out was a more perilous affair, and the seat mechanism was also designed to catapult the pilot downward and away from the propeller disc during an emergency. It's questionable as to how successful this mechanism would have actually been, if at all, as it would have only worked in certain scenarios, none of which involving low altitudes. And then there was also the equally questionable decision of using magnesium to build the airframe, which, whilst saving weight, made for incredibly poor odds in the event of any sort of accident on account of it being extremely flammable. Leaving the risks of immolation to one side, the aircraft was expected to be highly manoeuvrable, and it was designed to deliver a heavy punch. Mounted in the nose were a pair of 50 caliber machine guns and a pair of 37mm T9 automatic cannons. And this is where another innovative design feature can be found. The machine guns were installed on flexible mounts, and the cannons on fixed mounts. The nose was hinged and could be moved vertically through 3 degrees. This allowed the pilot to adjust the angle of fire for the cannons with the aid of a gun sight that compensated for the movement of the nose. This meant that the pilot could better lead his shots with the lower velocity cannons without large alterations to the plane's attitude, along with affecting the aim of the machine guns, and this, combined with high altitude performance, would make the Model 70 an excellent bomber hunter. Preliminary engineering data predicted a gross weight of just 9,000 pounds, a top speed of 510 miles an hour at 20,000 feet, and a climb to 20,000 feet of just 6 minutes. This data was well received, and on the 19th of August 1940, the Army issued a half million dollar amendment to the contract, authorising more advanced wind tunnel tests, and the manufacture of the first prototype, which would be designated as the XP-54. This, unfortunately, is where the first of a whole litany of problems began. Almost as soon as the contract was signed, Volte announced delays in the production of the prototype owing to the complexity of the pressurised cabin. In September, the army agreed to eliminate the pressurised cabin requirement from the design, with the caveat that Volte would design the XP-54 in a way that would facilitate the fitting of said cabin later on. Nine days later, Volte instead proposed building a second prototype without pressurization, armaments, or any other equipment not essential for flight testing. This would be produced more quickly, and then followed by a fully equipped first prototype later on. This plan was approved, and the contract was modified again to include the second prototype, which was known as the XP-54A. In what was rapidly becoming a trend of bad luck, the project immediately hit another major snag. As it was becoming more and more apparent that the United States would find itself at war sooner rather than later, Pratt & Whitney were given permission to cancel development of their H-2600 engine, with their full focus being shifted onto the air-cooled radial engines that would become the backbone of wartime US aircraft. This left the Army's experimental program in a bit of a bind, as it was now without an engine. But two weeks later, the Navy approached the Army about cooperating on the development of a different engine that might prove suitable. The engine in question was the 2200 horsepower Lycoming XH2470. During the 1930s, Lycoming developed the 12-cylinder I-1230 as a private venture, but when its power output was deemed insufficient, they decided to mount two of them together, bottom to bottom, to create a new 24-cylinder engine. On the 8th of October, the Army confirmed their interest in said engine, and much to their surprise on a field known for countless delays, they received installation and performance details on the very same day. Volte was then directed to redesign the XP-54 around this new engine, which necessitated an increase in overall weight to just over 16,000 pounds. Volte estimated a top speed of 480 miles an hour, which, while slower than the previous design, could be expected to maintain such speed at a much higher altitude of 27,000 feet. As a result of the engine change, the redesigned aircraft was known within the company as the Volte Model 78. The full-scale mock-up of the plane was completed by the spring of 1941, 
though not without further problems and delays. Over the previous winter, it had become obvious that the pressurised cockpit was still causing numerous problems, and it had been agreed that both prototypes would be completed without this feature. By the time of the inspection, Volte was confident that their design, having been modified numerous times by now, would be approved, but the reviewers of the US Army Material Division had other ideas. Concerns were raised about the use of superchargers with the new engine, and the chief of the Material Division directed that the XP-54 should be instead equipped with turbochargers. This, combined with numerous other minor requests, meant that Volte was forced to largely redesign the XP-54 again. Another outcome of the mock-up inspection was a desire to re-engine the second prototype with a 42-cylinder, 2,350 horsepower Wright R2160 Tornado, which would drive a set of contra-rotating propellers. And so, along with redesigning the first prototype, again, Volte got to work re-engining the second. The second prototype was to be redesignated as the XP-68, but then, in a decision that would have driven lesser designers to madness, the development of the XP-68 was terminated owing to delays on the Tornado engine's development. It was then ordered to be redesigned back to, and completed as, an XP-54, to be powered by another Lycoming engine. Finally, after months upon months of delays, redesigns, assessments, redesigns, wind tunnel tests, redesigns, and no doubt the occasional mental breakdown of the draftsman, the first XP-54 was finally completed in late 1942. After a static assessment, where, much to the relief of all, the army deemed it acceptable, it was disassembled and transported to Muroc Air Force Base for initial testing. Though it was the predecessor to Edwards Air Force Base, the home to many an experimental project, the flight test facilities during the 1940s were significantly less sophisticated than those of the Cold War. Essentially, there was an empty, and hopefully dry, lake bed, a tent with a generator, and a radio, and a couple of support vehicles, and that was about it. In the company of said sparse facilities, in a plane built from highly flammable magnesium, Volte test pilot Frank Davis took the XB-54 on its maiden flight on the 15th of January 1943. The 31-minute flight was uneventful, except for a malfunction of the Curtis propeller, which was subsequently replaced by a Hamilton standard unit. Davis took the plane on its second flight on the 27th of January, and by the 11th of March, 10 flights had been successfully completed. During said flights, Davis reported that it had excellent handling, and particularly it had very good stall recovery. But there was one noticeable problem. It became apparent that the expected top speed of 480 miles an hour was not going to be achieved, nor anything close, with the highest speeds achieved thus far being only 381 miles an hour. Even worse, it appeared that something in the engine was beginning to break, as after the last test flights, an alarming amount of metal was being detected in the oil, and the aircraft was sent back for an engine change. With a new, less broken engine installed, the XP-54 continued its flight tests before being sent to Wright Field for more advanced performance testing. It was around this time that it appeared with the name Swoosh Goose painted on its nose, a name apparently coined by somebody working at Volte, no doubt a reference to its elegant, albeit unorthodox, appearance. Unfortunately, this goose was not going to see its luck improved. As the performance tests were wrapping up in late 1943, continued problems with the Lycoming engine led the Navy to cancel its development, and this was pretty much a death blow to the XP-54, as there weren't any other suitable engines available within budget. As a result of this, the two XP-54 prototypes would be the only examples built. The second prototype was largely similar to the first, except that it was fitted with armament and an improved turbocharger. It made its first flight on the 24th of May 1944, rather embarrassingly featuring an incorrect serial number painted on the tail, which claimed that the aircraft flying was in fact a Volte BT-13 Valiant which, to be fair, should be considered an insult to the Valiant, as it was actually a very successful aircraft. 
After some disappointing flights that showed the new turbocharger wasn't playing nicely with the engine, the result being the mutual damage of both, the second prototype was eventually cannibalised for parts to keep the first prototype in a flying condition. This it did, with the first prototype logging 63 hours across 86 flights before it was grounded, after which it had the inglorious fate of being tested to destruction at the structural test labs at Wright Field. In consequence of this, nothing of this strange aircraft survives the day, only photos. Similar degrees of failure would be found in the three competing designs that initially lost out to the XP-54. The Bell XP-52, the Curtis Wright XP-55, and the Northrop XP-56. However, unlike the Volte model, an example each of both the Curtis and Northrop designs still exists today and all of these examples will get their own videos in the near future. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a special thank you of course to the patrons, with a special shout out to Kevin, Deliado, Bane, FB, Christopher R, Tronathon, Eric Heinemann, John Austin Jr, Ray Colotta, Keith Tarrier, Green Sea Ships, North Links Web, MCT, and Ted Parsons for their support as Wing Commander tier patrons. Wow, we are getting a lot of Wing Commanders now. Thank you all so much, and I will catch you all next time. Goodbye.